Section 47 of The Valley of the Moon by Jack London. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book 3, Chapter 12. Crossing the Sacramento on an old fashioned ferry, a short distance above Rio Vista, Saxon and Billy entered the river country. From the top of the levee, she got her revelation. Beneath, lower than the river, stretched broad, flat land far as the eye could see. Roads ran in every direction, and she saw countless farmhouses of which she had never dreamed when sailing on the lonely river a few feet the other side of the willowy fringe. Three weeks they spent among the rich farm islands, which heaped up levees and pumped day and night to keep afloat. It was a monotonous land, with unvarying richness of soil, and with only one landmark. Mount Diablo, ever to be seen, sleeping in the midday, azure, limping its crinkled mass against the sunset sky, or forming like a dream out of the silver dawn. Sometimes on foot, often by launch, they crisscrossed and threaded the river region as far as the peatlands of the Middle River, down the San Joaquin to Antioch, and up Georgiana Slough, to Walnut Grove on the Sacramento. And it proved a foreign land. The workers of the soil teemed by thousands, yet Saxon and Billy knew what it was to go a whole day without finding anyone who spoke English. They encountered, sometimes in whole villages, Chinese, Japanese, Italians, Portuguese, Swiss, Hindus, Koreans, Norwegians, Danes, French, Armenians, Slavs, and almost every nationality save American. One American they found on the lower reaches of Georgiana, who eked an illicit existence by fishing with traps. Another American, who spouted blood and destruction on all political subjects, was an itinerant bee farmer. At Walnut Grove, busting with life, the few Americans consisted of the storekeeper, the saloon keeper, the butcher, the keeper of the drawbridge, and the ferryman. Yet, two thriving towns were in Walnut Grove, one Chinese, one Japanese. Most of the land was owned by Americans who lived away from it and were continually selling it to the foreigners. A riot, or a merrymaking, they could not tell which, was taking place in the Japanese town as Saxon and Billy steamed out on the Apache bound for Sacramento. We're setting on the stoop, Billy railed. Pretty soon they'll crowd us off of that. There won't be any stoop in the Valley of the Moon, Saxon cheered him. But he was inconsolable, remarking bitterly, and there ain't one of them damn foreigners that can handle four horses like me. But they can everlastingly farm, he added. And Saxon, looking at his moody face, was suddenly reminded of a lithograph she had seen in her childhood. It was of a plains Indian, in paint and feathers, astride his horse and gazing with wondering eyes at a railroad train rushing along a fresh-made track. The Indian had passed, she remembered, before the tide of new life that brought the railroad. And were Billy and his kind doomed to pass, she pondered, before this new tide of life, amazingly industrious, that was flooding in from Asia and Europe. At Sacramento they stopped two weeks, where Billy drove team and earned the money to put them along on their travels. Also, life in Oakland and Carmel, close to the salt edge of the coast, had spoiled them for the interior. Too warm was their verdict of Sacramento, and they followed the railroad west, through a region of swampland, to Davisville, here they were lured aside and to the north to Pretty Woodland, where Billy drove team for a fruit farm and where Saxon wrung from him a reluctant consent for her to work a few days in the fruit harvest. She made an important and mystifying secret of what she intended doing with her earnings, and Billy teased her about it until the matter passed from his mind. Nor did she tell him of a money order enclosed with a certain blue slip of paper in a letter to Bud Struthers. They began to suffer from the heat, 
Billy declared. They had strayed out of the blanket climate. There are no redwoods here, Saxon said. We must go west toward the coast. It is there we'll find the Valley of the Moon. From Woodland, they swung west and south along the county roads to the fruit paradise of Vagaville. Here Billy picked fruit, then drove team, and here Saxon received a letter and a tiny express package from Bud Struthers. When Billy came into camp from the day's work, she bade him stand still and shut his eyes. For a few seconds she fumbled and did something to the breast of his cotton work shirt. Once he felt a slight prick, as of a pin point, and grunted while she laughed and bullied him to continue keeping his eyes shut. Close your eyes and give me a kiss, she sang, and then I'll show you what is. She kissed him, and when he looked down he saw, pinned to his shirt, the gold medals he had pawned the day they had gone to the moving picture show and received their inspiration to return to the land. You darn kid, he exclaimed, as she caught her to him. So that's what you blew your fruit money in on, and I never guessed. Come here to you. And thereupon she suffered the pleasant mastery of his brawn, and was hugged and wrestled with until the coffee pot boiled over, and she darted from him to the rescue. I kinda always been a mite proud of him, he confessed, as he rolled his after-supper cigarette. They take me back to my kid days, when I amateured it to beat the band. I was some kid in them days, believe me. But say to you, though, they clean slipped my recollection. Oakland's a thousand years away from you and me, and ten thousand miles. Then this will bring you back to it, Saxon said, opening Bud's letter and reading it aloud. Bud had taken it for granted that Billy knew the wind-up of the strike, so he devoted himself to the details as to which men had got their jobs back and which had been blacklisted. To his own amazement, he had been taken back and was now driving Billy's horses. Still more amazing was the further information he had to impart. The old foreman of the West Oakland stables had died, and since then two other foremen had done nothing but make messes of everything. The point of all, which was that the boss had spoken that day to Bud, regretting the disappearance of Billy. Don't make no mistake, Bud wrote. The boss is on to all your curves. I bet he knows every scab you slugged. Just the same, he says to me, Struthers, if you ain't at liberty to give me his address, just write yourself and tell him for me to come a-running. I'll give him a hundred and twenty-five a month to take hold the stables. Saxon waited with well-concealed anxiety when the letter was finished. Billy stretched out, leaning on one elbow, blew a meditative ring of smoke, his cheap work shirt incongruously brilliant with the gold of the medals that flashed in the firelight, was open in front, showing the smooth skin and splendid swell of chest. He glanced around, at the blankets bowered in a green screen, and waiting, at the campfire and the blackened battered coffee pot, at the well-worn hatchet, half buried in a tree trunk, and lastly, at Saxon. His eyes embraced her, then into them came a slow expression of inquiry, but she offered no help. Well, he uttered finally, all you gotta do is write Bud Struthers and tell him not on the boss's ugly tin type. And while you're about it, I'll send him the money to get my watch out. You work out the interest. The overcoat can stay there and rot. But they did not prosper in the interior heat. They lost weight. The resilience went out of their minds and bodies. As Billy expressed it, their silk was frazzled. So they shouldered their packs and headed west across the wild mountains. In the Berryessa Valley, the shimmering heat waves made their eyes ache and their heads, so that they traveled on in the early morning and late afternoon. Still west they headed, over more mountains, to beautiful Napa Valley. The next valley beyond was Sonoma, where Hastings had invited them to his ranch. And here they would have gone had not Billy chanced upon a newspaper item 
which told of the writer's departure to cover some revolution that was breaking out somewhere in Mexico. We'll see him later on, Billy said, as they turned northwest through the vineyards and orchards of Napa Valley. We're like that millionaire Bert used to sing about, except it's time that we've got to burn. Any direction is as good as any other. Only west is best. Three times in the Napa Valley, Billy refused work. Past St. Helena, Saxon hailed with joy the unmistakable redwoods they could see growing up the small canyons that penetrated the western wall of the valley. At Calistoga, at the end of the railroad, they saw the six-horse stages leaving for Middletown and Lower Lake. They debated their route. That way led to Lake Country and not toward the coast, so Saxon and Billy swung west through the mountains to the valley of the Russian River. Coming out at Heldsburg, they lingered in the hop fields on the rich bottoms where Billy scorned to pick hops alongside of Indians, Japanese, and Chinese. I wouldn't work alongside of them an hour before I'd be knocking their blocks off, he explained. Besides, this Russian river's some nifty. Let's pitch camp and go swimming. So they idled their way north, up the broad fertile valley, so happy that they forgot that work was ever necessary, while the valley of the moon was a golden dream, remote but sure, some day of realization. At Cloverdale, Billy fell into luck. A combination of sickness and mischance found the stage stables short a driver. Each day the train disgorged passengers for the geysers, and Billy, as if accustomed to it all his life, took the reins of six horses and drove a full load over the mountains in stage time. The second trip he had Saxon beside him on the high box seat. By the end of two weeks the regular driver was back. Billy declined the stable job, took his wages, and continued north. Saxon had adopted a fox terrier puppy and named him Possum, after the dog Mrs. Hastings had told them about. So young was he that he quickly became footsore, and she carried him until Billy perched him on top of his pack and grumbled that Possum was chewing his back hair to a frazzle. They passed through the painted vineyards of Asti at the end of the grape picking and entered Ukiah, drenched to the skin by the first winter rain. Say, Billy said, you remember the way Romer just skated along? Well, this summer's done the same thing, gone by on wheels, and now it's up to us to find some place to winter. This Ukiah looks like a pretty good burg. We'll get a room tonight and dry out, and tomorrow I'll hustle around to the stables, and if I can locate anything, we can rent a shack and have all winter to think about where we'll go next year. End of section 47